Someone is going to the studio to give Charles Gibson his phone, and you are going to live make the first public phone call on the Motorola StarTech. <laughs> well, I kept wow. thinking, oh my God. This is the Techsploder podcast, conversations with tech professionals about being human in a binary world. Episode 7, Dick DiBartolo. Techsploder is made possible by the financial support of our patrons, like one of our newest patrons, Crystal. If you like what you hear, head on over to patreon.com slash Jason Howell and support the show directly. And thank you for making independent podcasting possible. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Techsploder podcast. I'm Jason Howell, and today I have the honor of chatting with Dick DiBartolo. He's a true entertainment legend written for Mad Magazine for over 50 years, appearing in a record 459 consecutive issues, in fact, the longest streak in Mad Magazine's history. He's known as Mad's Maddest Writer, and he also wrote for classic 1970s game shows like Match Game. Dick has brought his bizarre tech picks to Good Morning America, ABC's World News Now, and actually continues to showcase the bizarre side of technology on the long-running show, The Gizwiz. Really, at the end of the day, Dick is a legend in TV, in comics, and in technology, even if the tech is, as he calls it in this interview, low-tech. And he makes me laugh. So let's get right to it. My conversation with Dick DiBartolo. How you doing, Dick? It's great to have you. I'm doing good. How about you? <laughs> I'm doing good. I'm so happy. I'm so happy that we could finally, you know, make this work. This this show is really just an opportunity for me to talk to people who I adore and who I respect and uh, get to know them on a on a deeper level around the topic of technology. So I had to talk to Dick DiBartolo. Oh, okay. <laughs> I I'm very light tech. Uh, you well, know. I I don't know about that. I mean, I, I, get, I get where you're coming from, but yeah. yet a large part of like, in, and we'll, we'll talk about your kind of everything that you've done because of which you've done a lot that is so unique to, to probably anyone else's story that I'll get on this show. But, um, but there's a large portion of it that is definitely in, involves technology. It's just not the technology that most reporters are covering, right? Like out there, it's not the yeah, iPhone. Yeah. You know? Yes. That, that, yeah. Yeah. What happened was technology, there was so much to learn and I'm kind of a goofy guy. And I thought I can't learn all this stuff because there's not even enough stuff here to make fun of. So <laughs> at some point I just started looking for the real, like at CES, everybody would run to these mammoth uh, opening speeches and and yeah. and hear hours of specs and and I decided to go down to the basement of CES where all the little startups were, people with crazy ideas. Um, and I started covering that and and somehow people sort of liked that. I mean the Gizwa show uh, is in year nineteen. <laughs> That's crazy. I know. I know. And it's gone through a lot of changes over the years, but yeah. I love that it's still going. Yeah. You and, of course, uh, Chad, OMG Chad. On on, on the Gizwiz show, does he go by OMG Chad or Chad Johnson? Uh, he's pretty much Chad now. The, the red Chad. hair is gone. Okay. He, he's, yeah. uh, he, he's grown up. Yes, yes. I talked to him not too long ago. I just wasn't sure how he does it on the show. But yeah, Chad's awesome. I love that you guys still have have that going. Has how how has that been? Because you know, for, for the longest time you were doing the show uh within the twit.tv yes, exactly. kind of ecosystem. And then you went independent. What what have you seen to be the kind of the biggest I don't know the biggest change, you know, in tr in transitioning from well, from you one know, part of it is, is that now it's just Chad and me and, and a producer. Yeah. Uh, so the fun part is if Chad suddenly has to go somewhere for something, we don't have to phone in, and then they find out if, if the ads can change, and and it, it's yeah. sort of like a mom and pop. It's like a pop and pop operation. <laughs> Um, <laughs> right. uh, so uh, that that part's fun. Uh, it's yours, so yeah, you can exactly. make the call. I, I, exactly. I mean, the money yeah. is a lot less, but basically, it's just fun. And and yeah. so the, the the thing about my career has always been, if the money's not there and it's fun, that's fine. 
Th- that's, that's good that's enough. Fine. So I've been yeah. able to do things that I enjoy, even if it's uh, not a moneymaker. Yeah, yeah. And you've kept your humor intact, which I mean, when, when I think of you and your work, humor is right at the top of the list. Like it, it seems to be that lightness, that humor, humoristic uh, view on life seems to be core and critical to how you tackle things like technology and how you tackled your work with Mad. How do, how do you keep engaged with that that level of, of humor, that fascination? Because it really seems like sometimes when you're talking about technology and it might not, you know it might be the least important piece of technology <laughs> in the world, you're still fascinated by it, even if you're fascinated by it because it's horrible. you know you still oh, no, have a no no I, no I, it's funny you say that because uh, this is probably going to be on this week's Gizwa show is this thing is getting incredible ratings. It, it's a, a flashlight, but why do you need a flashlight that has yellow, blue, green, uh, a burglar along? It, it, it just seems, <laughs> and, and they call it a keychain flashlight. This is bigger than my keychain. Yeah. I, and it's getting great reviews. Uh, I mean, I'm just going to review it thinking, do you really want all these things? I, I want a flashlight. You just go, uh, oh, I can see that. Oh, uh, it, it does the trick. It shows yeah. me the thing I can't see without it. Yeah, Great. exactly. Exactly. <laughs> I don't need seven colors and, and a alarm. Anyway. I mean, it's, so, it's kind of like a party in a, in a box that attaches to your keychain. Yeah. 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 I, I mean, the thing is, the more bizarre things I find, uh, the more fun it is. You, you know, I found mm-hmm. these do you know about um, anti um, motion sickening glasses? Anti motion. No. Yeah. Stupidly, the box says motion sick- sickness glasses. It's really anti motion sick glasses. <laughs> yeah, who would, who, yeah. who would want to put on glasses that give you motion sickness? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. But basically, they're 10 bucks and they're big plastic frames and they just have liquid in the bottom in a little tube so that as you move, you have a fake horizon. Oh. And I'm reading reviews and people go, uh, like 75% of them I think gave us five stars, is that this works for me. I mean, they look bizarre because they are big inflated glasses. but And then it has two side things for peripheral vision, also with liquid in them. And even though it looks weird, you know, I say, if you have 10 bucks and you suffer from motion sickness, this is an easy thing to buy, even if you, they don't work for you. If it's a possible solution, do it. So Absolutely. That's the kind of thing I look for, yeah. It's so interesting that you mentioned that because I think I saw not too long ago that one of the features of the newest version of iOS, Apple's uh, OS uh, for their iPhones, is going to include something for motion sickness as well. And it operates under the same kind of thing, although not quite the same approach in that it uses the accelerometer, I believe, or some sensor on the phone to determine the direction at which these dots on the screen will flow. Oh, so it's kind of yeah. counterbalancing in a similar way. Oh, that's so that if you get yeah. car sickness or motion sickness when you're looking at your screen and you, you know you're you're moving, that it will determine where those dots flow in order to kind of calibrate your brain. And, oh, and that's great. Yeah. That's great. So that's interesting. Yeah. That's a whole like angle of technology that we're tapping into. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> it, it is tech. Yeah. Very yeah. low tech, but it works. For, yeah. Low for tech. A lot, for a lot tech. of people. Yeah. So your career, I mean, you, I would say many people, if they know Dick DiBartolo, they almost certainly know you for your history with Mad and Mad Magazine. Right. And did the technology aspect of things, did that did that come into play like early on with, with Mad Magazine? Or was that something that really just started much later for an entirely different reason? No, I, actually, it's kind of weird because when I was a kid, I played zero sports. Uh, we had a house in Brooklyn. And we had a finished basement. And back then, there was a place called, uh, it was like Radio Shack, but it was called Lafayette Radio. And you could go buy things. And I went and I bought a microphone and I bought some speakers. 
And I bought one of the first tape recorders. I think it was a Wollen sock or a Revere. And I made a little studio um, in, in the basement. And somewhere I bought letters. And on the wall, it said RDB Productions. And <laughs> it's kind of funny Love because it. today, like 65 years later, I'm doing the same thing. But now I have five monitors and and – you know, a high old mic. And yep. so basically my dream as a kid still goes on that I'm still doing this and what that revert, what, what that worked out in, it worked out two different ways. One is at mad. If the movie had a lot of technology in it, like star Wars, they would assign it to me because they knew I love gadgets um, and then uh, a friend of mine was working working on the match game. It was just starting up, and he, he says, "You know, they're looking for someone to write some weird stuff for this show called the Match Game. Uh, you want to come down and audition? So I had to write like two hundred questions, which I did, and I got hired to do that. And the funny thing about working for Goodson Todman, and I worked on Match Game for eighteen years, but my office was full of gadgets and one of the producers barbara griff of to tell the truth said dick i'm leaving goods and time and i'm going to a local uh, metro media station here in the city and we're starting a show called saturday morning live an informational kind of offbeat show and a couple months in she called me up and she said you know it suddenly dawned on me maybe you would be a good guest would you consider getting some of those gadgets and we'll give you a table. And I said, all right. <laughs> I said, can I be funny? She said, you can do anything you want. The, the only requirement is that somewhere along the line, people have to learn something. Um, so I brought some gadgets down and I had a lot of fun with the host, Bill Boggs. Um, and she said, you know, people like this stuff. You have more? And I said, yes. And she said, can you be on every week? Which I did. And then I got a call from uh, the Regis show on ABC. Was I uh, under contract to Metro Media? And I wasn't. I said, I can do both. And then Regis led to Good Morning America. Mm -hmm. And then World News Now. And then at a press event... I met Leo Laporte and he said, you know, do you have time after the event? I want to talk to you. Um, and we went to get a drink and Leo said, listen, I started this network uh, this week in tech. And he said, I have a monthly show and I have a weekly show, but I want to have a daily show. Could you do a, get a daily show? And I said, yeah, I could do a gadget uh, every day. And then I said, also, Leo, I said, I rent a warehouse where I put old gadgets that are too much fun to throw out. So one day a week I could do a gadget warehouse thing. And he said, oh, okay. So we did that for a bunch of years. And then he started getting more shows. And he said, the editor's head. Why do we have to edit this for every day of the week? Can't you just do five gadgets on one show? So it's a show that we have to edit. Um, so that's when the weekly, uh, the daily Gizwiz became the weekly Gizwiz. And yeah, well, the, and you know the rest with Leo and for sure. Yeah, I mean a day a daily show that like that is no small feat even even if you work to like simplify and you know make it as as, as short or whatever like that is that's uh that's a lot of work to to keep up that uh that that momentum and that consistency yes, and yeah. everything I actually, and not to mention that's a lot of gadgets like i'm amazed that you had enough gadgets to fill that much time yes the, the worst part was doing the opening and closing and the letter of the week when you did it every day of the week was yeah so actually when we went to the weekly thing, it turned out to be way easier because you just did an opening and a closing for the five gadgets. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, yeah. And then at one point, Leo said, oh, you know, I have a great gadget. Can I do a gadget once in a while? I said, well, why don't you 
do a gadget every week, and we'll call it um, Turn the Table. It happened to be a Thursday. Uh, Turn the Table Thursday, where Leo does the gadget. And that was great for me because that was one less gadget that I had to do. Yeah, no kidding. I mean, yeah. you know, again, going back to the hamster wheel analogy, you step on that thing and it's it's next to impossible to step off. Um, how? So I guess the question that I have is you obviously you, you're collecting these gadgets. How are you getting a hold of them? Like are, are at a certain point, are you known so much yes. for the gadgets that people are sending them to you before that happens? Are you just like keeping your eyes posted and like, Oh, or, or maybe you're, you're a uh, sky mauling <laughs> when you're flying around. Like, how are you? Yeah, those? Yes. All, all, all of those things. And the funny thing <laughs> is when I first started doing it, you would have to beg somebody to borrow yeah. the, uh, the, the gadget. And, uh, and because I was, I was totally not known. I, my favorite story was at CES, there was a guy who had, these fake lanterns you would hang on the wall and it looked like it was a flame and it was mm. some little orange and red leds and a little fan and strips of nylon or something it looked very realistic and i said to the guy listen i'm doing this for um uh, abc and i have four complicated gadgets and i want to end the spot by saying not everything at ces was a lot of technology. Here's just a fun gadget that's only 30 bucks. And the guy said, uh, I'll tell you what I'll do. You buy one and then you tell me when the show is on and I'll watch it. And if you do a good job and you get information about my company out, I'll refund your $30. How does that sound? I said, that sounds like I don't want to do this. Yeah, that, that, that sound, doesn't sound fun at all. I, no. <laughs> I, anyway. Um, yeah. So, so you did not go through with that. I then. did not. I, I did okay. not go through. Yeah. But like, lately, uh, to tell you the truth, to save agony, I pretty much buy everything. I mean, mm. if, it, if it's a item that's a couple hundred bucks i'll ask the manufacturer if i can uh, get a product sample for a limited amount of time and um also i just it's so funny i just happen to have on my shirt um a little shelter i normally after i do a spot especially if it's beneficial to the company i usually call them up and say listen um I get gadgets for little shelters. They're bazaars. If you don't want this back, can I donate it for one of their well, auctions? And no one has ever said no. Mm, so right. so th th that's basically uh, – so expensive gadgets I show, and then they go out to the shelter. That's amazing. Yeah. That's awesome. That's a great way uh, to, to give them second life, right? Yeah, so, exactly, exactly, exactly. Yeah, so I mean – I run into this sometimes with, with phones and have over the years where it's like, suddenly like I realize like, okay, so I've got a drawer full of phones. Like this just feels wasteful. Like I don't, I don't need, I don't have a need to like have phones in this, in these drawers unused. And so, yeah. you know, I've given away, I've donated yeah. because it just seems like, you know, I, and I suppose I, you know, I do have a, a, a small collection of phones, you know, as part of my, like my set piece, but at a certain point, it's just like I don't need all this technology. Like it, like it needs to have a life beyond me. Yeah, and absolutely. the the you know few weeks that it gets coverage on whatever show I'm doing and everything, that's really great that you do that. Yeah, no, and, and then there, there are fun things. You know, I have a the warehouse full of this stuff, and then yeah, here at the studio, I have Dick's gadget shelves, and it's kind of funny because one of the things I have is the first digital Casio camera for the consumer. It took 30 pictures. I believe it had like 10 megabytes of memory, <laughs> built in memory with the instruction book. If it jams, mail the camera back to Casio <laughs> and we, 
he will attempt to get your pictures off and reset your camera. And the list price was, what's your guess? Oh, boy. So what, what year was this? When this was, was this? you know, I don't remember the year, but the very first available digital camera. Oh, God. So we're talking Are, you know what? So somewhere. Yeah, Can so, you jam for one second? Know. I'm going to get the camera. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah, yeah. Go for it. I would love to see it. Okay. <laughs> and of course, he knows exactly where to go to find it. Uh, and it may, uh, uh, let me see. Okay, now. Uh, <laughs> All right. This is it. Oh, uh, okay. That looks hey. nicer than I thought it was going to look. Well, you know oh, what? Sweet. They invented uh, 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 the ah. selfie. The selfie. There you go. Okay. That's pretty slick. No flash. Oh. Okay. Had no flash. Okay. But one of the earlier digital cameras, essentially, the right? The first. They claim oh, the boy. first. They yeah. claim the first. Okay. So if I had to throw out a number, I don't know, uh, $400. I, I honestly, I have no okay. idea. Okay. Um, the list was nine ninety nine. No way. Wow. And they were selling the first, I don't know, 5000 for five ninety nine. <laughs> so <laughs> 600 bucks. Wow. It's kind of amazing. I mean, that's why it's hard to get rid of stuff like that because it's yeah. like so amazing. amazing. Yeah, it's like historical for yeah. sure. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I, have so, this, I have the original Sony Walkman uh, up on a shelf, the very first that's, one. That's a good one. That's a good one to hold on to. Yeah, I, I certainly wouldn't get rid of the Sony yeah. Walkman if I if I had the original. So, okay, so I'm, I'm amazed by something here, Dick. You've got... A, like a studio at least that we're seeing here and then you've got yeah. a, a place you know that you that you store technology um as well outside of this room and actually i'm just going to show a little video here real quick uh that you had shared not too long ago that shows the Disneyland, which you know shows oh, yeah. the kind of some of the tech that you, you know, some of your history wall, it looks like here, um, but also the tech that you use to run the oh, shows yeah, and everything. That, yeah, that is where I am right now. Okay. So you've got a lot of, of stuff, you know, stored everywhere. Do you have like an, an organizational system? Like you were able to go to that camera super fast. And well, that's it, because that's on, that, that's on, on my Dick's warehouse shelf. I am terrible. I when when I get overwhelmed, I take a cardboard box and I throw everything in it and I write on it to be filed. <laughs> How many boxes do you have that say to uh, be about filed? 30, okay. About, <laughs> about thirty. About <laughs> only uh, so that's the get the gadget warehouse shelves. Uh, okay, There's the okay. very first uh, uh, atomic clock, which kept oh, here, terrible here. time. Because it checked with the uh, uh, the first radioactive clock, it checked with the uh, Boulder Dam clock once every twenty four hours, and it was never on time. I mean, not like your phone and oh right, and and yeah, right up now, to the second it checks yeah. like every every five seconds. Um, yeah, that some some old old stuff there, and some bizarre inventions. Uh, all the way down on the left lower shelf is a guy <laughs> invented this thing. You slipped your remote control in it, and then it had over the thing, you slid these sliders so that there was one slider over volume up and down and one slider up over channel up and down so that those were the four buttons you used most. <laughs> and it was just it was just such a ridiculous thing i couldn't throw it out to keep you from be, what being uh being concerned with any of the other unnecessary buttons but is that exactly exactly for the person <laughs> who who has a little trouble seeing right and yeah. is always always hitting the wrong button you just know the big red is volume up and down and the green is channel up and down Got it. Okay. All right. Hey, you know, you know, and a lot of this, like some of these technologies, like I said, uh, Sky Mall earlier, kind of has a Sky Mall quality. Kind of has a, uh, you know, a home shopping network. Maybe yes. yes. Hammocker Schlemmer. If you uh, Hammocker, yes, exactly. 
Yes. Exactly. I mean, endless supply of of weird, wacky. Yeah. And uh, that was the great thing. Hemika Schlemmer had a big New York store, four blocks from Goodson Todman Productions. So I would go there once or twice a week, and I remember they had the world's first microwave, and <laughs> it was like gigantic and the opening i mean you could maybe make two cupcakes in there it was so steel and and it was five thousand dollars <laughs> and then they had the world's first plasma tv it would only it could, it, it, it could heat your house I mean, <laughs> there was so much heat coming off this tv but it was the first the first it was officially the first, so you know, important. Yeah, that's it. That's that is it. The first. You got to start somewhere, I suppose. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that is amazing. We got to take a super quick break, and then we're sure. going to come back, and we're going to talk a little bit more about this stuff because I'm I'm sure over all these years you've got some you know favorites. You talked about the Walkman and everything, or maybe even people have told you they've had some favorites. That's coming up here in a second. All right. So you've been collecting technology over the years. You've been, sh of course, showcasing it on your show with Chad, like we talked about earlier. So folks definitely need to uh, check out the Gizwiz and, uh, you know, get get a you can still get a, a kind of a weekly view into some of these technologies uh, that you've shared on the show. Have things as technology has evolved and you get, things have gotten smarter and chips have gotten more powerful and memory has become abundant and everything. Has that made the world of this kind of level of technology less interesting or has it actually kind of supercharged it, like given it some extra fuel to do more weird, uh, interesting you know, things? You know, I'm finding possibly uh, it's an age thing but a lot of things have gotten too complicated mm. and and by trying to simplify them, a, a, a perfect example actually i i told this story uh, just this past week on gizwiz because it came to mind is there was a guy at ces had a little a tiny little sound machine um and it, it produced great sound you couldn't tell that, that that it was repeating a, a little white noise machine and uh i met him uh, the second year, and he said, oh, we have a whole new version. I, I said, well, what changed? And he said, we pay a lot of attention to what our customers want. And he said, you can't believe what they wanted. I said, what? He said, they wanted more knobs. And I said, I know why. Because with this little sound machine, you clicked one button to pick the sounds you like. When you found the sound you like, you held that button in, and that became the volume control. But it you you kept forgetting that, and it kept changing off the sound you had gone through forty sounds to find. Oh boy, yeah, yeah. And then I thought, yes, it was way better when one button picked the sound, and then two other buttons picked the volume, mm -hmm. and. Uh, another guy, he had invented the, uh, the trash bin that as you approach it, it opens up. Mm -hmm. And I said to him, uh, uh, this is great. So the second year I went back to him and he said, Oh, you know, you did that on, on, a, a Regis. And that was great. The, the, uh, bin, as you approach it, it opens wait till you see what I have now. I said, Oh, okay. The electric paper towel dispenser. Yeah, I know. This doesn't sound yeah, that that yeah. Like I can it's, understand it's, the walk walk towards a trash can automatically yeah, opens yeah, thing. There yeah. are many times in which I'm in a kitchen and I have a need for something like that. Yeah. I have that I you know, I have the manual push it down with my foot type thing and that, right. that does the trick as well. Yeah. But um so where said, you're going right now just kind of sounds yeah, like Yeah, I know. I yeah, said so he mess. said, No, don't touch it. Go to the menu. The menu? Yeah. <laughs> One sheet or two sheets or three sheets. All right. Two sheets. All right. Now hit go. And I watched the machine and I said, isn't the machine going backwards? And he goes, well, it has to go backwards to find the seam. Oh, God. <laughs> so it goes backwards and it finds the seam. And then it puts out two sheets of paper. 
So I go to rip it off and he goes, no, no, don't rip it off that way. You'll pull the machine over. You have to grab it at the top okay. and slowly I'm thinking, are they, it was like $89. I thought, how is this possible that someone spent all this time? Yeah. Who wants this? It doesn't sound like there was any sort of, uh, any sort of like community testing or <laughs> R&D on a solution like this. <laughs> to, I mean, I think, I think with, with technology, what I've, what I've noticed in, you know, over the years is that the more complicated we get with a certain syntax or a certain like knowledge base that you have to have in order to do the thing, like all you're doing is you're taking your large possible, you know, amount of users. And with every bit of complication, you're reducing that to a smaller and smaller pool and a complication, you know, a, a product like the one you're talking about, like that doesn't sound like it has any, any sort of chance at anything. All, and no. and if, if anyone is motivated to buy it, they will almost certainly give it a bad review wherever they bought it from or whatever, because exactly. it's not practical. Exactly. Exactly. So that's the kind of fun thing. It's, it's technology <laughs> gone wrong. Yeah. Yeah, indeed. What, what are some uh, pieces of technology that, that you've shown that I, I guess that you were surprised that people connected so well with, I mean, you, you go on these, you know, you've gone on many of these large scale platforms. Um, can't, can't get much you know wider scale than, you know, something like good morning America, you're reaching a ton of people and you're bringing on this technology. Are the things that you expected to be a bomb that people actually connected deeply with? No, you know, like, oh my the, 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 I think one of the most nervous good morning Americas I ever did was they arranged for Motorola was introducing the StarTac. Remember the, mm -hmm. the, the, the flip phone? That was a and big it was moment. The first, oh, the, oh, I mean, it was an incredible hit. And they were introducing it at CES at uh, a nine o'clock press conference. But Good Morning America wanted to do it on the show and it would be shown two hours earlier. And the PR guy called and he said, listen, for GMA, no problem that you uh, be the first to show this. And he said, do you know what they want to do? And I said, uh, I'm not sure. Do you? And he said, yes. <laughs> he said, we're going to have a person come to your hotel room two hours before the show to give you the phone and show you how to use it. And someone is going to New York. I think it was Charles Gibson was hosting the show. Someone is going to the studio two hours before to give Charles Gibson his phone, and you are going to live make the first public phone call on the Motorola StarTech. <laughs> well, I wow. kept thinking, oh my God, this show is live. Anyway. This better work. <laughs> <laughs> it, 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 fortunately, it did. So yeah. it, 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 it was great. So, so that part was fun. My favorite gadget, I think, of all time was the sling box. The sling I used to travel. Oh, yeah, okay. Yes, I used to travel a lot, and a lot of hotels had like five channels. Mm -hmm. And with sling box, uh, back then, sling box, you had it at home, you hooked it to your cable box and your router. And then wherever you were, you hooked it up to the TV in the room, and then you had control over your cable box at home. It was wonderful because I could watch ABC News local, and I always thought that was one of the most amazing things ever. Um, and I think, I think they're in business now, but I don't think they build boxes. I think they just run a big channel or something. Um, yeah, like I just plugged in Slingbox on Google and, you know, the little blurb that it gives you for the site says the demand for Slingbox has decreased. As uh, a result, we are focusing our efforts on continuing to develop and enhance innovative products for Dish TV. Oh, Sling. OK. So, okay. They, so then, that sounds yeah. like they're doing technology for, yeah. for others yeah. at this point. But, yeah, that was a big deal. I mean, you know, it wasn't too long ago that we had to really consider how we throw our media around with these new capabilities of the internet, you know, allowing us to do things like time shifting and cloud and everything. Um, 
Yeah, that's that's been a real big uh, real big change in in our habits as a uh, you know as, uh, as users. You, of that reportage. Kind of I mean, I, I can shoot B roll for a World News Now spot with with my phone, and I have this little mm. Anchor wireless mic kit. Um, and and even at trade shows, you'll come up and do the thing with my phone and hand her a wireless mic. And then someone will come up pushing a cart with cameras on it and lights. And I'm thinking it's like, which, which one is better? They're probably both, you know, very, very similar, right? Like I I've certainly thought about this, especially as I've gone independent is like, when I do things like this, do I need to bring the big camera setup? I probably don't. I probably just you know, bring us, bring a phone with a mic. I think what, it, you know, and I think to a certain degree, Viewers, people who are on the other side of the glass watching, you know, watching uh, the content that we create, they've become a lot more forgiving for these things, and, and to, a, to a certain degree, that they're more endeared to the run and gun style approach versus the big kind of overly produced approach. Uh, uh, absolutely, I, I, I do this uh, show called Giz Fizz. It's just a mm-hmm. silly show playing match game and stuff, um, and they stopped streaming over at twit. So the show, mm. so tw- uh, Chad called me up and said, I'm going to teach you how to use OBS. And I said, oh, Chad, this is going to be so beyond me. He said, no, no, no. So I learned how to use OBS sort of okay. Yeah. Um, and I've done it maybe now, maybe 14 episodes of uh, Giz Fizz. Um, and I, one time got totally lost with what I was doing. And I got several emails saying, you know, there are no mistakes. It's all entertainment. Mm -hmm. When things go wrong, that's entertainment. So, Mm -hmm. you know, why do you say you're sorry that this went wrong when we're just here to be entertained and the mistakes are just a part of it? And, And I think that's one of the fun things about uh, when you're using, you know, the networks, every, you, you cannot get further apart than a network and a podcast. Mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. You know, I, the first time I went out to CES, they sent out three producers, uh, uh, seven people. And we went through the halls and everything. And then on air, they said, uh, Dick, you have two minutes and 10 seconds for your first. And then two minutes and 11 <laughs> seconds for your second. I said, you know, there are four gadgets in the second. He said, okay, hang on, hang on. We're going to redo his. Okay, not two minutes and 11 seconds. You can have two minutes and 16 seconds. <laughs> so, <laughs> now, Oh, wow, uh, thank you. Yes, thank yes, you for this yes. glorious extra amount of time. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Whereas in, in 2011, I went out to Comic-Con uh to, I had won an award and I called Leo was going, going to a new studio. And I said, you know, I'm in San Diego Would the studio be finished. And he goes, you know, it's so close to being finished. Just fly up here and we'll do it. Um, and so I was talking, well, you know, were you producing the very first Gizwiz? I I produced for a while. I don't think I produced. Well, maybe. I mean, that was that was uh, anyway. Time ago. Whatever. I know I was producing for a while, but I don't know that I was necessarily producing right when we went into the. Oh, uh, okay. Studio. All right. So the very first time, I forgot who was producing. Forgive me. Mm-hmm. Um, and Lisa said, and, "And where where are you go? What's the set going to be?" And he said, "You know, we haven't decided that yet." And Lisa said, "Well, you know, we're not live. You have two hours to decide what the set's going to be." Now, if that was a network, two years would be about where they started mm-hmm. thinking mm-hmm. about what the set. So that's mm-hmm. kind of the fun of uh, uh, podcasting and and all of these things. They're just so much instant stuff. You you can stop and say, "Oh, let's look that up now." So that that well, part's fun. Well, but I think what's what's interesting also to me in hearing you kind of talk about these two different worlds is that. The broadcast world, when it comes to the technology that we have, and maybe this is just a testament to how good, you know, the the cameras and and recording ability are on our phone. But I do remember working at CNET, you know, almost twenty years ago, 
and seen you know and having to do radio hits and having to do having to be very very attuned to the quality and the technology that's used and or you know sending video clips to a, a TV station for them to repurpose there's a certain level of quality <laughs> whereas now it seems like networks are far more inclined to just let you Skype in and sk or not yes, Skype, but you know, Zoom or whatever. And it's not 100% perfect, but it's easier. And so it's good enough or, or record your bits on your phone. And as long as it looks and sounds pretty good, then it's good enough. I mean, the, the expectation, I think even for those high scale, high pressure environments of, of like live TV and everything, we think of them as having such high expectations and requirements, but I mean, that's, even changed that's been influenced by the yeah. level of the tech that we have now yeah no absolutely i uh, um now i do world news now which is the overnight news i like it because it's it's uh, they're very loose over there and a lot of fun but mm -hmm. the producer said if you don't want to come in just do it by skype we're fine with that uh mm -hmm. do it by zoom we're fine with that it's 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 great yeah yeah that's really cool um what uh is there is there a piece of technology that you were nostalgic about from like when you were from when you were younger that you're just like you know and and maybe who knows knowing you I'm I would imagine if you are nostalgic about it it's it's highly likely that you have it stashed away somewhere just so that you can hold on to it uh, but is there is there a piece of technology from maybe your childhood or your younger days where you're like that's that's kind of like the I don't know the 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 sprout of this interest. Well, uh, something that and it's two, I have two of them in the warehouse. It, I used to make eight millimeter movies, eight millimeter film. All right, mm -hmm. satires on uh, of movies. I made a musical and a, and a western, and we would show them uh, at, at a hotel or something, and. Uh, they were elaborate. We rented uh, 1930s Rolls Royces for the celebrities to arrive in. And, or, and the celebrities were all the people from the game shows that Goodson Todman mm -hmm. did. And there was no sound back then. But a company called UMIG made this sound projector that used your tape recorder. So you threaded the tape up. And then before it went on to the take-up reel, it ran through the projector. Now, you couldn't do lip sync because it was not quite accurate enough. But you could do sound effects and you could do music. And my movies were usually voiceover done by uh, Gene Rayburn, who used to host a match game. Um, and I always <laughs> thought, it would be a riot is we would be in a ballroom at a hotel and Goodson and everybody's there in tuxedos and I'm up on a table and on the table is another card table. And then there's my little Revere tape recorder and I'm threading this through this projector. And, and I was thinking, this is just so Mickey Mouse, mm -hmm. but, it's kind of just, it's just like crazy fun that all these rich people and celebrities are here to watch an eight millimeter film. I, it just, <laughs> uh, and then uh, a name you probably don't know, Dorothy Kilgallen was uh, a celebrity on, on, on the What's My Line, but she wrote um, movie reviews in, a, in the Journal American, a long deceased newspaper. And she wrote a review like it was, People had really missed it. There was a giant opening last night at Delmonico's and writer, producer, Dick D. Bartolo. You'll be hearing his name all. <laughs> and it was such an inside joke that she did it in a, in a back then major newspaper. So all those kind of things are just great fun. Yeah. To be able to have that. That's, uh, that's so, I, I, I love the ingenuity of taking these things, you know, these things that have inherent limitations, the, you know, the eight millimeter didn't have sound. You were able to figure out the technology that could bring it, even though it wasn't perfect. I can certainly connect that to a lot of things that I did when I was, when I was a kid. And yeah. I mean, obviously yeah. technology was a little bit further advanced by that point, but still sometimes working within you know, the, 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 the realm of, of imperfection and, uh, you know, the lack of capability and stuff, 
you can come up with some really interesting creative things w- working within those restrictions. No, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. It's, and it's great fun. It's kind of rewarding. Go, oh, my God. Totally. To pull it's, it off. This kind of works. Yeah, absolutely. A lot of curiosity there. Um, we are kind of running up against the time, but I wanted okay. to see if I could ask you a non-tech question here. Sure. Um, and I, I don't know where this is going to go, but I figured of all people, you would be the person to ask this because I'm sure you've told a lot of stories in your time. Um, I The question primarily is, I feel like everybody has a story of some sort that if you're like at a party and you're in a conversation, you tell this story and you get the people to go, wait a minute, what? Holy cow. Really? Is there any story that comes to mind that qualifies there that, that like you could tell at a, at a, at a party and, and people just are amazed that this actually happened. Yeah. Uh, all right. So, <laughs> so the, the publisher of mad, uh, William M. Gaines was kind of crazy. He was, he was, he said, Dick, I make a lot of money from Mad. So that's why he, he would take us on trips. To, he took us to Russia and Japan and Italy. And anyway, yes. one day he calls me and he says, write this date down um, and you'll, you'll be gone the entire day. I said, it, anything else? No. Uh, anyway, so we the day is coming. And he said, okay, the day um, is just go to Grand Central Station and meet me there at nine o'clock. So I go and I said, can I bring Dennis, uh, my boyfriend back then, my spouse mm-hmm. now? He said, oh yeah, Dennis, yeah, this year. He said, especially for you, but. So they announced the train to Boston. Bill said, go down to the platform, don't get on the train. And I'm thinking, <laughs> what? <laughs> so we're standing there and, and the Metro liner is sitting there. And I said, Billy, what's going on? He said, just hang on. Uh, we hear a train whistle, and out of the tunnel, a tiny little switch engine comes out, pushing an 1890s observation car, on the back of which there are three chefs, all in white with the big hat. And he said, this is especially for you. You love trains? They're hooking this train up to the Metroliner. It's going to Boston. They're going to put it on a siding in Boston. You guys, he said, I'm going to stay on the train. He said, "You there were just 12 of us. You guys can go roam Boston for seven hours or whatever. And he said, and then be back by 7.15. They'll hook it up to the 7.15 Metro liner and take us back to Grand Central. I mean, that was one of the most unforgettable days of my life. It had an open platform. Uh, I mean, it was just astounding. Wow. Just that is incredible. Yeah. See, you wanted someone to say wow. And you see? Exactly. That sounds that's that's amazing. Like that's yeah. that's an experience that most people will never have. That's no, wonderful. Oh, and and is do you love Boston? I've never been to Boston. I've uh, been there, yeah, Boston's great. Boston's great. Yeah. Yeah. I have to check it yeah. out. But I but I won't be able to check it out that way. So I'm a little no. sad about that. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. That could be your story. <laughs> Dick okay. Bartolo, it's so wonderful knowing you. I, I just, I really adore you and your work and everything that you've done to make people smile and laugh. And um, yeah, you're just great. I, I really oh, appreciate well, well, thank you. you. And you know what? I should, I'm going to plug just one thing. Yeah, um, absolutely. Please do. Oh, that's that's oh, what because, I was going uh, to next. Uh, I'm one of the advisors, but if you're looking for something to do this summer and you're traveling, the Norman Rockwell Museum has a, a huge exhibit called Museum Gone Mad. And it's nice. going to run from June 8th through October 27th. And I shot, they shot several videos here. So I'll be there video wise. And I'm going to do a live Zoom thing for them at some point. Um, so that'd be a fun thing if you're traveling around to look up the uh the dates i gave you norman rockwell museum from uh june 8th soon to october 27th and that'll be in what where will that exactly will that oh be? i'm sorry it's in stockbridge uh mass m-a-s uh-uh. awesome Stock, yeah that's amazing cool and then um how can people find the work that you're doing um with with your shows right now is there a um, place you okay uh gizwiz.tv is where the show is that's every yep. thursday 7 30 uh 
East Coast time. And Giz Fizz, if you like Matt's game and you like old movies, and we do just it's just a silly show. Is Wednesday yeah. nights uh, eight thirty Eastern time, and that's also at gizwiz.tv. And my website is gizwiz.biz. There you go. Cool. Dick, thank you for hanging out with me today. It was a pleasure. I I really enjoyed this conversation. And uh, yeah, keep it up. (laughs) Have a a great trip. And maybe hopefully you'll come back with your wow story. I, yes, I've I've got some wow stories. I I hope to come back with a few more. (laughs) Good. good. Thank you, Dick. Thank you. Okay, buddy. All right. Huge thanks to my guest, Dick DiBartolo, one of my all-time heroes. So great to have the chance uh, to talk to him. All right, everybody. I can't do this show without your support. It's plain and simple as that. Right now, as I'm building the show and building the numbers and the audience and everything uh, so that I can attract advertisers, hopefully at some point, um, the only most direct way uh, that you can support and keep the show going is to visit my Patreon, patreon.com slash Jason Howell. And I appreciate you looking ad free shows you'll get in return also early access to videos a discord community an exclusive patrons only pre premiere live stream so every week a live stream just for patrons right before each episode premieres for like 30 minutes it's really a lot of fun and you can be an executive producer of the show like Jeffrey Maricini John Cuny Bill Rudder and Katie Lake if you like at a certain tier anyways so please take a look over there and thank you for supporting this independent podcast Textbloader podcast premieres every Friday at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern on the Textbloader YouTube channel with the audio podcast publishing to the feeds later that day. Not much later, but don't forget to like, rate, review, and subscribe wherever you happen to be. It really does help us out. And you can find everything you need to know about the show at textbloader.com. Thanks again to our guest, Dick DiBartolo. Thanks to you for watching and listening. I'm Jason Howell. I'll see you next week on another episode of the Textbloder Podcast. Podcast.